welcome back to a new year of Never Seen a Film Club. We're back. My name's Emma Bainbridge. I am the streaming producer here at Accidental, in case you don't know who I am. Who is she? Who is she? Where did you find her? And I'm joined by my fabulous co-host, as always, who is Robert J. Simpson from Sunny Point. And we discuss the films that we have seen at Never Seen a Film Club. And we kicked off the January very well mm. with Sam Raimi's 1981 classic, The Evil Dead. I fear that the only way to stop those possessed by the spirits of the book is through the act of bodily dismemberment. I don't care what happens to her. She's your girlfriend, you take care of her. It's, uh, it's yes. Been, it's been a it's been a month, but it's the Lunar Year New, new Year started yesterday. I'm I'm totally confused when it comes to the New Year's. It's always New Year somewhere, right? It, yes, we'll go with that. But it's been a month since we've been here, so the last thing we saw was in Bruce. That's so nice, yeah. um, we we kicked off again with some nice violent um, zombie apocalypse type films. I'm spotting Bruce. a trend in your tastes, Emma. I mean. <laughs> I, this wasn't me, this was all the film club members. Well, yes, yes. This is all their fault. This so thank, thank you. So it's your fault. Been an interesting um, discussion, even on the night. People loved it or hate it. It seems to be a Marmite film. So I missed the conversation on the night. I couldn't get, attend the, uh, <laughs> the actual screening. Yes. How was that? Well, we had a group of people who very clearly big Evil Dead enthusiasts, uh -huh. deadheads. Are you my deadhead? Yep. Um, Rock just laughter from those guys. The people who are slightly new uh, to the club, who've never <laughs> come before, baffled, mystified, <laughs> and wondered why the heck I'd put on a, a very lengthy zombie movie in the middle of January. Uh, Gillian from Accidental said it's possibly the worst film she's ever seen. The worst movie ever! So oh. that was harsh, I felt. She, uh, hasn't I, I, she hasn't watched a lot, to be fair. This is true. <laughs> she, apart from that, 20, the two-year window. Yeah, which 2014 is to 2016, if it was on at the Barbican, she's seen those. But um, she absolutely hated it. But for the most part, people who had uh, never seen it before and mm -hmm. seen it were like, yeah, I can see why it's a, it's a beloved cult classic. I mean, it's certainly an interesting combination of teenage boy tropes and, and fun and all that kind of good stuff. You'd seen it before. I've seen it before. I've seen it a long time ago, but um, I saw it because, revealing something about myself, um, my first interactions with Sam and Ted Raimi came from Xena Warrior Princess. She was Xena, a mighty princess forged in the heat of battle. Wait a minute, Xena can't fly. I told you, I'm not Xena. I'm Lucy Lawless. Oh. Okay. And so I was a huge fan of Xena, Huge fan of Bruce Campbell's character in Xena. So when I got a little bit older and started investigating, like I was like, oh, this is, this is a, this looks quite good. So I think I was about 14 or 15 the first and um, only time I've seen Evil Dead. But um, rewatching it, I, I was like, yeah, I, I, I know why I loved it as a as a teenager. It's got everything that you you want, mm -hmm. um, guts, gore, glory. Um, it's very 1981 and. I loved it, but at the same time, it's one of those ones that I do find interesting that it has been latched onto as a cult classic. But I think <coughs> that's partly because the sequels have been so much better. Yeah. So it's it it's again, it's one of those trilogies that completely changes, I think, genre from start to finish. So it starts quite sinister uh, not sinister, I think it quite it takes itself quite seriously. It does, yeah. 
and then by the time you get to the third one, mm -hmm. it doesn't. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that's a genre shift, though. Um, I, I, I mean, I think part of the, the reason that the film got so latched on to back in the 80s, um, yes, it's played completely straight. Essentially, it's, it's a very straight film. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it, it plays it for the horror and the gore, and it was a little independent film that they wanted to do stuff with. And that was it. They, you know, they never looked really beyond the Roadhouse mm -hmm. and, as a kind of distribution network. So it's able to kind of play along those things. There's a poster in it to uh, The Hills Have Eyes, I know, mm -hmm. which I, I think has passed me by so many other times. So there's that kind of nod to Wes Craven's work and, and that kind of Roadhouse horror movie. Mm -hmm. um, but I think certainly in the UK, its whole stats is sort of anchored around the, the, the video nasties. Mm -hmm. um, it was initially released, there were some issues with it. Uh, and then 1984, basically it was refused certification. Um, they they kind of couldn't get away with doing the stuff even with the cuts that they'd already made. Mm -hmm. And it got lumped onto the list with the video nasties. It's probably one of the more accessible and least unpleasant of the video nasty films. You know, it's actually quite, I mean, it's played quite straight. It's quite, it's quite, the, the horror isn't, I mean, it's gross. The, there's, yeah. there's some pretty nasty stuff in there. Um, there's two attempted rapes, um, which which were problems, but generally speaking, it, it's, it's you know, this isn't Cannibal Holocaust. It had this reputation, but it was, it, you know, it was an underground film, and it wasn't until 1999 where Anchor Bay released it finally in the US, mm -hmm. uh, and it made its way to DVD for the first time that everything started to change. I think it was 2001 that was finally available in the UK uncut. So that's a quite a quite a big gap mm -hmm. in that. I mean, it was one of those films that I remember seeing it on VHS. My brother introduced me to it and there was quite this fuss about it. And, I, you know, I, I was interested to see it. And it's it's one that I've gone back to so many times. I've, I've got multiple versions of this now <laughs> on, on various formats. I bought it again last year. I have no need to buy this many copies of one film, but I have a lot of them. Um, and it kind of grows on me, but for me, you know, you've already said it, it's, this is not its sequels. Yeah. This feels very different for Evil Dead 2. For, if you're not familiar with this, um, they got the opportunity, they got a bigger budget, and they essentially did a requel. It's a remake of The Evil Dead, but up in the comedy. Mm -hmm. And it's, it really takes advantage of Bruce Campbell's talents. It does. The second time round. Evil Dead 2, a half remake, half parody of the first one, with a ratio of horror to comedy swapped. <laughs> And that's the tone that, that followed through into Army of Darkness, into Ash vs. the Evil Dead TV series, yeah. into the comic strips. Um, where it's deviated has been in the Evil Dead remake in 2013, mm -hmm. um, which was played for very straight again, and Evil Dead Rises, which is coming out this, this April, mm -hmm. um, which is the, the, the new version of it, which doesn't have Ash in it for the first time, mm -hmm. um, apparently. Uh, but it seems to be playing things very straight. I watched mm -hmm. the trailer for it earlier on. It's, it looks unpleasantly... I don't know, it doesn't have that fun. Yeah. Um, which is what I now associate with Evil Dead. Yeah, no, completely. I remember going to see the, the most recent remake of it and being surprised at how much darker they, the direction they spun on. I mean, it, it kind of the, the remake goes in the, in the thread, I think, of mid 2000s remake like 2010s mm. remakes where they did just genuinely take source material that had a little bit more playfulness and a bit more comedy and, and dark humor about it and completely annihilated that in in favor of going for um dark and brooding and, and scary and, and and let's take the the material seriously mm. and i think that kind of killed it for me uh, no pun intended Puns. Um, <laughs> um but watching the particularly the scene in the forest with the the vines mm -hmm. in the the new one extraordinarily more uncomfortable than in the first one. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're they're doing the same thing, but again, it's there. I think in the remake because it's come from a place where you know we've had so much more graphic sexuality come through in in horror, especially um, in that kind of late eighties, like not, not even in terms of sexuality, but like in terms of the use of women's bodies in horror. Um, it's it, that that scene in particular. There's a lot of really grotesque close-ups of the the thighs and the the vines snaking their way through, and it's a lot. I think it is a lot more graphic, mm. um, but for the sake of of making it serious, and that kind of destroyed the the concept for me. Um, watching the remake, I wasn't a big fan of it. 
um, mainly because I'm not a big fan of remakes anyway. Um, at least not modern ones in the last kind of 15 years um, or so. Um, and yeah, none of the actors have the same charisma as Bruce Campbell. I mean, <laughs> you're not going to. You can you can but try. You will not succeed because Bruce Campbell is a he's a deity from a, a he's just he's just he strike like Bruce Campbell for me is like one of those old screen idols. Mm -hmm. He's 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 very much of that caliber for me when I think of, of him and his performances. And he, hey, he's done serious acting. <laughs> well, um, but even his character in, in Spider Man, mm. it's it's just Ash, but as a wrestling announcer. He's just got that kind of quality for me where I'm just like, he's so, he's very charismatic and kind of lovable no matter what he does. But you root for him no matter what. And in the remakes, I didn't find myself doing that for any of them. I was like, I could kind of take his or leave his at this point. I mean, if you all get vanquished by g g the, the ghouls that come, I'm, I'm kind of, I don't think anyone would have missed you very much, to be honest. But, um, but yeah, it's interesting to see how uh, on a remake, on a rewatch, sorry, of the the original, I forgot how how kind of visceral some of those little moments are, especially with like in terms of uh, uh, bones and ankles. Mm -hmm. Oh, there was a there was a there was a leapt cry that came from the theater um, when a few of our a few of our viewers uh, <laughs> saw that moment. Um, with some ankle peeling, um, which is, <laughs> which again, I'm very, I, what I get impressed with is the production value of it. I'm like, it was very low budget, and even, and I, I know it's kind of cheesy, and the blood is very, very red, and all the rest of it. But I'm like, some of those moments are very visceral and like mm, feel very real. I think it sells itself very mm -hmm. well. Um, I mean, I, when I first encountered this, I also was getting in. I was on Anchor Base Press list mm -hmm. so I was getting sent stuff in the states on a regular basis and as I started kind of getting deeper into the Evil Deads I was also getting into things like Lucio Fulci's films mm -hmm. uh, and a bit of Argento and like that kind of era and, and and that upping of the gore and that suspension of disbelief mm -hmm. you know that it's 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 obviously fake and latex mm -hmm. but in the moment and particularly because Evil Dead plays it, the Evil Dead plays it straight mm -hmm you go along with them, you feel that, you see the anguish in the eyes and the faces and you buy into it. And yes, okay, so the, you know, the, 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 the caro syrup kind of blood is very, very red, but you know, we're talking about deep arterial damage. Yeah. I mean, this isn't, this isn't a surface nick. It's, yeah. it's, so it's, that has always worked for me. And I think that, I mean, I can see why as a teenager, coming to this film, mm -hmm. like that was kind of exciting. It was yeah. slightly taboo. It was a little bit more than, and I think that's where a lot of people leap into it. Mm -hmm. But it does have a lot of other stuff there. I mean, the craftsmanship's amazing. The cam Sam Raimi's camera work, yeah. the stuff he does is, is fantastic. But even that, that, that closing shot, which I'd, I'd forgotten, was apparently done via a motorbike, just driving a motorbike through the cabin yeah. right up to Bruce. Um, I mean, that, that whole thing, that, that way that it disorientates you, um, there's a shot where it's the camera's overhead, which is quite unusual. It's quite Hitchcockian, mm -hmm. um, but it's going over the rafters of the house, and you hear the vroom, yeah vroom, as it goes over everything. I mean, that, that, that there's a lot of stuff like that that's quite cinematic. This is not just a horror film. This is something that's doing something else. I think. Yeah, I think that's, that's definitely something that I picked up on watching it again. I was particularly impressed with the, the sound mapping and the soundscaping of it, mm. because again, thinking of it as a I think it's very easy to make fun of Evil De the Evil Dead and to kind of be like, oh, it's just this cheesy horror. I'm like, but as you said, it's got very good production value, and the camera work being phys like so physical puts you on edge uh, in a way that would not be done today. Where you know, you feeling those little nuanced bounces of a of a, of a physical camera move, um, really does put you in that space and like gives you a connectivity as a as a as a voyeur into this world that you don't get necessarily anymore. But the the sound, the sound mapping I, I remember, and then the soundscape work, I remember during the, um, just even during the beginning where they're kind of in the car and it's kind of very subtle little like chatting and it's very nice and easy and you, but you can still hear leaves and I'm sure most of this is mistakes because they were recording on the fly, but I don't, I don't want to say that. 
put into the ear that so that silence versus the the deliberate silence and eerie moments that come later um is just beautiful and also the 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 movements being matched with those kind of eerie otherworldly noises mm. um and even just the hip is just genius the way that it was done I, like because there's pops and clicks and things that make it feel very real and you're like there's a little part of you it's very like kind of Blair Witch where you're like is that just a recording that they find and decided <laughs> to make a film of it or is it or is it something else but yeah I, I, and again I, I'm a sucker for a narrator from another another time being like oh yeah so just um we're just here in the thing and uh, everything's hunky-dory at the moment and blah 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 and oh everyone's listening this is quite cool and we found this book and this book seems to be a bit dodge and then like later on being like run run for your lives <laughs> um I've, I've always liked that as an as a narrative tool um so that i i really enjoy but yes the just some of the physical techniques that even just in the in the in the stage fights as well or Again, you would not get that today, but you wouldn't have like a young actor being told to like just basically throw themselves around in a in a forest and mm. beat yourself up with this two by four. It's not going to happen. But I think that's something that ca has carried through all of Raimi's work is that he does have this real vintage love of of old old school stagecraft and that kind of lens from like the the, the late fifties and the sixties and then coming through. It, it goes through all of his work, I think, and it's something that I really like because as someone who kind of has neglected that kind of era in, in filmmaking um, because it just of, of how I've grown up, um, the 80s is mine. So um, having to go back and realise that those techniques from the 80s that I love so much didn't start there. They actually are much deeper and go through. But um, just revisiting like a... a just a very well, very hands-on film. Um, I just, I really, I just like the physicality of, of the Evil Dead. Like as a, as a, from the props to the to the camera work, it mm. feels like a very physical film. I think particularly for the first one. Mm -hmm. I mean, ignoring the rest of the franchise. Yeah. Um, this first film feels very authentic. Mm -hmm. uh, everything is practical effects. Everything's in camera. Uh, very, very little kind of post-production work in, in terms of those sorts of things. Um, the location, I mean, it's mm -hmm. all shot on location in an actual cabin in the woods. <laughs> you know, you see the breath hanging on the air because it's Baltic. Yeah. Um, supposedly going to Tennessee because it was meant to be milder than Michigan, I think, where they were <laughs> going to shoot originally. Turned out it was the coldest winter they'd had. Uh, plan backfired. Uh, but when you've got that, it, it changes the way that they make things too, you know, they're working with the economy, they're working with the resources that they have at their disposal. Mm -hmm. And I think the film's probably better for it. Mm -hmm. That said, I, you know, I, I so seldom watch this version of the film. I'm more likely if someone asked me to introduce them to the Evil Dead franchise to say, go and watch Evil Dead 2, yeah. start there. But then also because this is separate, because that's a reset, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, you've got, you've still got the same kind of concept and characters, but Evil Dead 2 is where the franchise starts and that has continued to today, mm -hmm. um, not the Evil Dead. You know, so it's almost like you've had these, I mean, you essentially you've got two false starts because you've got the Within the Woods, that's what's called, the original sort of half hour short film that they made that got them the funding to make the Evil Dead, which essentially becomes the film that gives them the funding to make the Evil Dead 2 yep. uh, and, and sort of spiral out from there. But for me, it is about that. It, what makes this so brilliant, and as a, anyone who aspires to make films, is to show you what you can do with very little. Oh yeah. Um, and and just how you know if you got some friends that are willing to suffer, suffer <laughs> for, for their a few art. weeks, yeah, you know, months, sure. um, you can have something special. Yeah, it's interesting as well how long the original cut is because we got a uh, well the director's cut is because in my head it was kind of a hundred and like a hundred minutes or so mm -hmm. and then it's not no. it, it's it's quite long and it's it what i again i appreciate it it's not very and again in my head i was like oh it's very like fast paced and you don't breathe and i'm like actually re-watching well at least the the director's version the director's cut that we had the the restoration that we watched there's actually quite a lot of breathing space in between big these big action moments and it's it's really nice to have the the kind of the time to, and I think that's why it is kind of has you on your your edge so much when you when those moments happen because they, you do have like 
a respiratory time to be like, okay, and then I'm, I'm watch it. And then you kind of have that false relaxation. Mm -hmm. And then something happens, and then you're like, ah, I'm running around, there's things yelling at me, they're coming to get me, I'm not going to join them. And then and I'm like, that kind of, and that again puts you in like, if you were in that situation, it's kind of probably what you would experience, like running from room, like one place to the other. You'd have that kind of false, false kind of time to relax. And then another evil dead shows up. But that, I mean, that's awesome. how suspense should work. I mean, yeah. if, you, if you just bombard people with, Effect oh, after work. effect, you yeah. know, there's nothing there. So it's, I mean, it's it is classic filmmaking. Mm -hmm. It's it's allowing your film to have that that allowing your characters and allowing your audience to kind of get into something so that they'll kind of get their tension worked up. It's mm -hmm. as you said, you know, the cinema is is such That's that you know good. everything builds up nicely. The tension's there. A lot of it's about the set dressing and, mm -hmm. and how, how it looks and how it feels, and then you kind of ramp up the shocks gradually, gradually, mm -hmm. until there's a gore fest. Yeah. At which point it's just, will anyone actually get out of this alive? And mm -hmm. Ash is just so frustrated by it all and tired. And it's a very different kind of process. I mean, I, 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 I'd forgotten how different the character is between this and Evil Dead 2. Mm -hmm. Because by Evil Dead 2, you know, he is very, um, very active, very visceral, very physical kind of performance. He is attacking himself. Um, and doing all that stuff and, and, and mugging for the camera, which we don't get in this. This is this mm -hmm. is this is quite a pretty boy, you know. He's, yeah. he's, he's doing his kind of matinee, matinee, yeah, look matinee thing. idol. Again, the, the the earlier parts of the romance that you see, mm. and the f and you're like, yeah, you could probably pop that into just a conventional drama and believe it mm -hmm. that they they're doing their best. There's no kind of like overly sweeping gestures. But at the same time though, I don't know if, I, if my partner gave me a mag tiny magnifying glass on a chain, I'd be super thrilled about it. It's an antique. Yeah, but. It was meant to have a plot point originally. Uh, yeah, but I, the, I, I cause I, again, I'm like, why? And then I thought, oh, it's gonna, oh, that's gonna be important later. And it was, just not the way I expected. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I've, I'd forgotten, A, how long the film was, B, how much breathing room there is within the film. But um, yeah, the the thing that I really took away was how well it was made. Mm. Um, it's one of those things that as, because I, I was born in 1988, I'm giving my age away. Um, so by 88, it had kind of probably not existed too well in the, in the zeitgeist. So it wasn't probably until, what would we say, the mid 90s that it became sort of known as like, oh, it's the evil dead, mm. it's this cult classic. Um, so for me, it's always kind of been on the peripheral of my film knowledge and like kind of been there, but it's not never been something that I've, I've, I've super been um, hyped in or into, um, which I find really interesting because there's people my age and slightly younger who are absolutely obsessed with Evil Dead mm. and, find, and find it and probably as you said, when it, it finally got a big push on DVD release um, with all the different versions uh, who are uh, who love it and see it as this like real big part of their cinematic upbringing um, which is interesting because again it's a, a little zombie a little independent it's probably one of the first kind of modern interpretations we have of an independent horror film maybe the first one where you go oh yeah it's an indie film mm. um, and yeah it's just this, this zombie movie from the 80s I just find it really interesting how people have latched onto it and and, and use it uh, and love it I kind of find that interesting that your your kind of take on it is so almost uh, almost go as far as dismissive slightly of it, it. It's, 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 it's a kind of it throwaway little film and and that's not my experience of it. it's also mm -hmm. not my experience of it within the genre mm -hmm. you know um part of that is we've obviously had a lot of stuff since then sam raimi's reputation since then bruce campbell's exhaustive b-movie career yeah um and they've been very good at it they've been very good working with the fans as well mm -hmm. and kind of sharing that stuff and that kind of fandom that grew up around it, I think is also a huge important part mm -hmm. of it. Any of these films that develop that, that additional mm -hmm. cult status to become like a, a, a you know, pantheon of the, mm -hmm. uh, this, this is a, a hugely important film for, for multiple reasons. Um, 
I think it's a really important franchise in terms of modern horror and it and, and for comedy horror ultimately. Mm -hmm. Evil Dead sits so odd because it's not the comedy horror that the rest of the the series is. Yeah. But it's a really important stepping stone to that. And it's 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 just interesting because I mean I, for me it this is an important film. Mm -hmm. This is a film that people talked about. This is a film that people sought out. Mm -hmm. Um and you know we're 20 years after it's kind of like had its you know accessibility opened mm -hmm. um so i guess i'm just i'm slightly older than you so i'm just maybe old enough to remember that point where there was still this kind of taboo about it where it still was something that that was sought after this was like the clockwork oranges and the exorcists yeah. that there was a few years where all those films still felt kind of illicit and it didn't matter what the quality of the film was like mm -hmm. because you knew that they were forbidden yeah that somebody was deciding that you can't see bits of this okay that made it something that you wanted to seek out and it kind of develops a reputation as a result of that and probably ultimately became slightly more elevated than maybe it deserved mm. um but it's impossible to 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 extricate it from that that kind of cultural moment that was going on mm -hmm. and then you know these films were everywhere um they were they sold really well that encouraged more people to see them mm -hmm. and now i mean the the back in the bargain bins, but there's still a good kind of uh, base around them. Yeah, it's just, I don't know if, for what reason, because Clockwork Orange was always very, as, as you mentioned, like the that kind of thing of being like, oh, well, you know, was this band film and blah, blah, blah. I remember that, mm. and like the, the, but I don't know, for Evil Dead, I don't, I, maybe it's just because I hung out with a lot of goths <laughs> who just had seen it already and had talked it up, and I was like, I mean, it's fine. Maybe that's why. Who knows? But um, okay, I would never take away from its importance. Like as someone who loves very conventionally cult film, because I'm like obsessed with the Rocky Horror Picture mm. Show. But I thought you liked them. They like you. They didn't like me. They never liked me. I would go to conventions and stuff for that. I'm a big fan of Comic Con and you know Zombie Con and all those kind of things that happen. I love that, and I'm like, if you latch on to Evil Dead and it's your thing, go for it and be the most Evil Dead fan that you you can because we need more, for lack of a better word, we need more weirdos out there. Girls, watch out for those weirdos. <laughs> we are the weirdos, Mister. Um, because it makes life interesting to have people who really know and care about things. You know, give me my Necronomicon and I'm, I'm a happy boy. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, having, I have to say, out of all of the films that we've shown in Never Seen It Film Club, this is the film I have the least experience with. I've only seen it once before. Um, so it's as close to have never seen it as I, as I could get. Um, and I would definitely give it like a, a good solid seven or eight out of ten. Okay. Um, just as a just as a film itself for its cultural impact and the way people love it it's obviously a 10 and for bruce campbell's it's lots of bruce campbell's <laughs> out of 10. um he's fantastic i love him um but yeah having seen it so many times and having all the versions was it just nice to revisit it again <laughs> uh yeah it was uh, because i haven't watched it for a number of years it was Good to reacquaint myself with a version of it that I, I, I kind of forget. I've forgotten how serious it was. I've forgotten how well played it was. Um, it was like watching a new film to some extent because like a lot of that had, had dissipated through the distillation of the, uh, the, the, the sequels. Um, but yeah, it was a pleasure to rewatch. I mean, this, this film for me still works. Mm -hmm. Um, and because I'm obviously ridiculously biased, I also have a huge Ash figure at home. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, this, this, uh, I'm, I'm very fond of this franchise. Um, for me, it's a 10 out of 10. And I, ha I mean, of all the films we've shown so far, this is the one I'm probably most acquainted with. Okay. Um, it, I just think it's, it's essential watching. If you're into your horror films in any way, shape or form, this is worth a watch. Mm -hmm. I think if you're into filmmaking, this is probably worth a watch. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't like gore, um, go and stick on Bambi. <laughs> There's at least one death in that, so it's kind of a horror film. Okay. All good. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Robert. Pleasure. And thank you guys for joining us and supporting the Film Club and Accidental and Cinepunked. Uh, don't forget, if you're not a member already, 
you can join for as little as three pounds a month and you get to come along watch film and join in our discussions um, and you get a special early preview of our very special edits that appear mm. on the youtube um which are fantastic if uh, the editor is watching it's me I it's me hi i'm the problem Fabulous jokes, um, but yes, thank you so much for your support. Uh, you can check us out at Accidental Theatre on Instagram and Facebook and most things. And you can follow Robert and Cindy Bunt. Uh, you'll find me uh, on Twitter at Avalard. You'll find me under my own name, Robert J. Simpson, on other places. Uh, Cindy Punct or Cindy Punct on Twitter, uh, Facebook. What was that thing? TikTok, TikTok, stuff like that. We're Cinepunked Film on Instagram. But if you look for Cinepunked, find the thing that looks like a Northern Irish film thing, you will find us. So that's, that's how it works. Excellent. But well, thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Bye now. Hey guys, thanks for watching. My name's Emma from Accidental Theatre. This is Robert J. Simpson from Cinepunked, and we run Never Seen It Film Club, the film club where we watch films that you've never seen. We'd really appreciate it if you could come and join in to our membership program where you can come and see a lovely film in our beautiful book bar every month and it costs just three pounds a month and it's amazing and um, the membership button should be right about here so if you're just like you're just there and if you can't join the membership that's no problem just like and subscribe to the channel